um, and really a celebration is on and really a celebration of, um, you know, the work that everybody, everybody did and all the really cool projects that came out of it. So, um, that's, that's going to be the focus tonight. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, at the start, just to get everybody on the same page. Um, for those that aren't part of the group that attend, if, if anybody drops in for that. Um, but yeah, I think for the most part, I'd like to hear from some of the actual, um, participants. And so we're going to spend a, a fair chunk of time doing that, I think at the end, and then anybody else who wants to speak as well about their project is, is totally free to do so. Um, because then, yeah, we want to hear what you guys um, ended up finding. It's really, I think the, the main result from this working group was um, the work you guys put into it. So that's kind of what we're, we're looking at. Um, and of course, we're going to announce the winners of the, um, the classification challenge and talk about um, prizes and all that fun stuff as well. So um, yeah, it'll be a good 45 minutes to an hour um, where we go over all that is sort of the plan. So yeah, I mean, it's almost um, yeah, five after 535. So I mean, we might as well get started now. And as others trickle in, we can, um, you know, catch them up. But I will share my screen. I've got just a few slides here to go over. Do, do, do. Okay, as is always the case. Can you guys see this? Um, we always do this check in my group because sometimes it doesn't work. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is the classification competition results presentation. Um, it's a bit of a review as to what we worked on in this, this, this working group, just as a brief review here, um, it was really on this idea of transforming data into information, um, thinking about spectral and information classes. And this is specifically referring to sort of remote sensing um, spectral data. So in this case, we were looking at Sentinel-2 data, um, the various bands that we have available from, from that, um, that satellite on the left, and how we can organize this data and transform Form it into a variety of different um, land cover classes using um, primarily Python and a variety of different machine learning techniques um, that we're going to look at in a bit here uh, to create a land cover map. And our reference data that we were using and one of the sponsors for this project was NRCAN. Um, and so we were using an NRCAN land cover class data set um, as, as sort of the, the response variable in this, um, this project. And the overview for this, the, 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 the working group that we had here was um, not only thinking about um, the actual machine learning aspect of things, but also um, for those who are uh, less familiar with it, um, figuring out how to sort of interact with the geospatial data, you know, accessing, downloading um, Sentinel-2 information, that sort of thing, because um, it's not always inherently obvious how to get access to these data sets and how to extract the variables you want. Um, so we spent a fair chunk of time going over that at the beginning, um, which I think was was fruitful for many different uh, members of the group, you know, practicing how to organize this data um, and feeding it into um, the ML classifiers in a meaningful way. That's always a big part of the um, machine learning pipeline is actually providing meaningful um, predictors to your model. Um, so we spent a while chatting about that. Um, and then we focused later on in the, in the working group on um, improving general performance, model robustness, um, on unseen data and optimizing the model um, for a variety of different, um, different portions of Southern Canada and looking at different combinations of uh, spectral bands that are available from Sentinel-2, like NDEI or SWER, for instance. And so the minimum goal for this project uh, was to develop any sort of ML-based classifier that can identify a variety of different land cover classes across Southern Canada. Um, and so with that in mind, that kind of leads into the competition, um, which is the focus of this talk here um, and is the culmination of all the work that, that people did in the working group. And the idea behind the classification challenge, just for those who weren't familiar, um, was to develop an ML classifier that takes 12 different spectral bands from Sentinel-2 and predicts um, 19 different NRCAN um, land cover classes from, from the 2015 product. And so right away, like this is a pretty challenging um, task, right? It's, it, uh, we were fairly specific with the challenge um, that we laid out um, and that was on purpose. Uh, because we wanted to push members to see, you know, how how much performance they could eke out of this um, this small data set of twelve spectral bands, right? We weren't allowing anything like um, uh, elevation information, for instance, or other atmospheric variables that might be useful. Um, really limited them to the Sentinel two data to see um, how they could use this. 
and then 19 different um, uh, classes is also quite a quite a wide range, right? So um, it wasn't just you know like a binary classification or picking out a couple different um, popular types of land covers. It's quite a, a wide variety um, that we expected um, members of the group to to be able to predict. Um, so it, it was it was quite a challenge that we put out before um, our group, and I think they came together in a good way to create some really neat models um, in, in order to determine sort of who the top uh, performers were. Um, we tested each model against a hidden set of three cloud-free summer Sentinel-2 scenes in lower Canada below 60 North uh, to give them, you know, an idea of sort of what is fair game in terms of testing data. Um, and these were approximately like 20 kilometer, 20 square kilometer um, images. So they're also quite, quite large, right? It's a big chunk of land that you have to cover and lots of different land cover types could be in that chunk of land. Um, and they aren't necessarily balanced classes either. You could have more trees, for instance, or more lakes, depending on where we're looking. Um, and then accuracy was um, assessed using balanced accuracy. Um, and this is just sort of a more, a more meaningful um, metric for uh, evaluating performance when you have a, a unrepresentative, or sorry, a um, unbalanced data set of, of, of classes that you're predicting, in which case, we would have in, in, in this project since you're not necessarily gonna have the same number of tree pixels as the same number of lake pixels um, in an image that you're looking at. And so just as a recap, these are what these land cover types look like. We're using the level two data. So there's 19 of them ranging from a variety of different forests at the beginning um, into shrublands, wetlands, croplands, urban and water and snow and ice. And so, like I said before, quite a, a wide variety um, that they were responsible for predicting. Uh, which, which further um, enhanced the, the challenge ahead of them in this project. Okay, so now into the fun stuff. This is the colorful part of the presentation that I'm going to go through um, the different study sites we looked at. So uh, this, is, this is new information for everybody. None of the people in my working group um, who competed knew where these sites were in advance. That was part of the challenge. Um, they had to sort of <clears throat> create a model that could, could predict against any sites in southern Canada before below 60 north and to take all of these different regions into account. And so I'm just going to briefly go through these so that everybody's on the same page. Um, what you're looking at here, by the way, is just a, a, the, the NRCAN land cover um, classes um, plotted for, uh, for, for Canada. So the different colors represent different land cover types. And you can see the locations of the different test sites we looked at um, to evaluate their models here. So the demo site we provided to everybody, again, these are 20 square kilometer grids or so. This was in northern Saskatchewan. Um, this was something that all members of the project had access to, to to test their model to make sure that it was going to be able to um, ingest data in a similar format for the unseen sites that we were looking at. Um, this was, a, you know, picked, most of these were picked somewhat randomly, um, but this, this one was good because it had a good mixture of... Um, uh, sort of separate lakes, wetlands, um, farmland, agriculture, that sort of thing, um, to make sure that their model could handle uh, multiple different land cover types. And the distribution of the bands looks something like this. Um, I'm going to show one of these for each of the, the sites that we looked at. So these are the 12 spectral bands they had available. This is pretty much all they were able to use as inputs to their model or different combinations of these. Uh, these are what the land cover classes would look like in this region. Um, and this is the distribution, the different densities of each of those land cover types. And you can see, you know, in this case, lots of agriculture and wetlands, um, some lakes and a variety of others were also sort of scattered throughout. Uh, the first site that they tested on here was the Eye of Quebec. This is a really cool site that I've looked at in the past. I just really like the, the structure of this lake here uh, for those that are unfamiliar. Um, and I thought it was an interesting test case because um, Usually water is pretty easy to predict from these models. They, they typically do a pretty good job. Um, but this one is neat with the, the, the lakes that come off, uh, or sorry, the, the rivers and um, uh, yeah, the streams and, and that sort of thing that come off the edges are, are very abnormal. Um, and then you've got the, the ring of water as well, which was kind of neat. So I wanted to see how well the models would do at predicting that. And then this is also a very heavily forested area. And so this is a good test to see how well you can get that deep evergreen forest and that sort of thing. Um, the second site here was in the GTA in Southern Ontario. Um, so this one I picked because it's got, you know, not only a big, a big reservoir um, with the lake, but we've also got a lot of agriculture and urban buildup um, to see how your model um, predicts these, these different land cover types. And you can see the, the distribution in this case 
uh, for the different um, types of land covers is different from the previous site as well, with much more of a focus on the agriculture and urban areas. Uh, and then the third site that we looked at was this Kamloops area in BC. Um, and this one was kind of neat because it has these sort of finger lakes that trail through um, and then this scattered sort of um, urban region as well, as well as lots of elevation and uh, snow-capped peaks in the top right-hand corner. So um, not a whole lot of snowy pixels, but there were a few, and I was curious to see how the different models would do at pick picking those up. And so those are, our, those are the regions that we tested on. Um, and these are the different teams that were assembled in our group. So uh, we had, I think, six teams that ended up um, submitting a model, which is great and around a dozen um, different team members uh, that, were, that were part of each of those. And we had a, a wide range of different model architectures that were examined. Um, so, you know, things like random forests, we had CNNs, um, boosted decision trees, some neural networks, clustering algorithms were applied. So it was a wide range of, of different um, techniques, which is what we were really hoping to see. Um, and we're gonna hear from, again, some of these members later on to see what went into the, the training and validation and all that, you know, optimization, all that fun stuff that went into each of these models. Um, because I think different people took different approaches and that ended up with different levels of performance in the end. Okay, so I'll get into just a few results uh, from the models. So these were the different, um, uh, this is sort of a breakdown on the left, the different types of models. So we saw a lot of random forests, which was kind of expected because that, I think we talked about that quite a bit um, in the working group. Um, it's sort of an easy one to, to jump into if you're not super familiar with ML. And it can also do a very good job, as we'll see later on. You know, it's a very powerful technique. Um, we also had uh, an MLP, um, a CNN um, as well that was competing, which was great. Um, and so it wasn't only random forests, but we had um, sort of that as the maybe like two thirds of the models that were submitted. And then on the right, I've got some very high level performance statistics. Um, I'm keeping the teams anonymous for now, just because we haven't announced the winners at this, list, this part of the presentation. But um, in black, we have the time to predict for one of this, for the, for the scenes on average. Um, this is in seconds uh, for each of the teams. And then we have the model size as well on, uh, in red, sort of on the right here in gigabytes. And so it's you know, kind of interesting to see how different, <clears throat> different models from different teams perform. You know, some of them are quite large. Some of them are over you know, three gigabytes in size and take a couple minutes to run while others are much um, smaller, uh, you know, on the kilobyte or megabyte size for the most part. Um, and they may only take, you know, a one, one or two minutes to end up um, predicting uh, the scene in front of you. And so this could be an important thing. It's not super important for our course, or sorry, our working group, but, um, you know, there's always something to consider when you're, when you're developing your model, if it's gonna be used operationally, sort of how big it is and how long it might take to, 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 to train and to predict. Okay, so these are the accuracy results. So what I'm going to show here on the left is your balanced accuracy score and your um, uh, your typical accuracy score. So balanced accuracy are going to be the bars, and then the corresponding just regular accuracy is the uh, circle uh, dot on on each aligned with each of the bars uh, for each of the different teams. Again, these are still anonymized. Um, each team is a different color, and then each section of the graph is for a different experiment site. So the first bit here on the left is the demo scene. So before I tested any of the other sites, I, I always applied it to the, the scene you had available um, just to see, um, you know, make sure everything was working. And I was also curious to see what the scores looked like there. Um, and so you can already see some interesting patterns with certain models like this blue, you know, team two, getting accuracy scores in the high and balanced accuracy scores in the high 60s um, compared to some of the other ones, which were maybe 20 or 30. Um, and so this was kind of cool. It was like, okay, where do we go from here? Does this, um, the, these models that do really well generalize to the other sites? And so if we look at site one, again, this was the eye of Quebec site. You can already see a vast difference in terms of performance from different models. So this one team, the, the blue team that was doing really well here wasn't doing quite as well for this, this new site. Um, so maybe some potential overfitting going on there, for instance. Um, uh, and then some of the other sites doing much or start doing sort of consistent uh, performance, for instance, the blue and orange teams here. Um, and you can also really start to see the difference in terms of balanced accuracy versus regular accuracy for these sites where the, the regular accuracy score is, you know, in the high 60s or low, almost at 70 or 0.7 um, with the balanced accuracy sitting closer to 0.3 or 0.4. And so a similar trend sort of sort of exists for the second site in southern Ontario. This was the one with the GTA. Um, you get 
I think a much more similar score across all the sites when you're looking at balanced accuracy with a slight boost in this red site or this red um, group at the end here. Um, it was performing a little better now. Um, and still this, this blue team at the beginning doing quite well. Oops. And if we do site three here, uh, this is the Kamloops site. Um, you can really start to see again, sort of this, this blue team doing well. Um, and then the orange and the yellow team um, improving their scores here. And finally, when we look at the mean performance, so the average balanced accuracy across all tested sites, so not including the demo scene, just our three unseen sites here, um, you can see the final scores on the right here. And so um, since we're most interested in balanced accuracy, again, the bars, the bar values, you can see which teams place first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So the first and second teams, um, you know, their, their models seem to perform a little bit better on average than the other ones. Um, but we had still, you know, the, the team that came in third um, pulled ahead a little bit and we had a very sort of close finish for fourth, fifth and sixth here, sitting around, you know, 0.25 or so in terms of balanced accuracy. And so with that in mind, let's reveal who each of these teams were um, with the final standings and the prizes. Uh, so um, fifth place was the jungle team. So congratulations, Jungle Team. Um, you have a $100 prize. I've got the prize um, amounts on the bottom here. In fourth place, we have the Eastern Standard Team. So this is also $100 um, for them. So congratulations. Again, these, all these prize funds were um, uh, dictated at the beginning of the, the working group. So these were you know, known ahead of time. In third place, we have Looney, um, which got $200. In second place, we have Green Team with a $350 prize. And in first place, we have the Enviro Nerds, which are sharing a $750 prize for first place. So congratulations, everybody. Great work um, all around. Really good performance um, for all the different models. I was really happy to see, um, uh, yeah, just how well they all did. I was really surprised on all the unseen um, sites because, again, we had some some really difficult constraints placed upon you at the beginning of the, the working group here. So great work. Um, and then additionally, we also mentioned at the beginning as an additional incentive, there's another thousand dollars that's split um, among all um, members or all people, all individuals who participated in this final challenge, um, who were part of a team where their model hit at least 20% balanced accuracy score. And I'm pleased to announce that every single um, team that submitted made that minimum goal so every person um, that you saw on the earlier slide that I, I was introducing all the names, um, every person's walking away with some cash because this is split um, amongst all of the competitors. So great work, everybody. Everybody is going to make a little bit of uh, prize money from the competition. Okay, so just going to the final part of this, I'm going to talk very briefly and then I'll stop talking and let my, um, my group members um, talk um, because I really want to hear from them. Uh, I'm just going to go over some kind of some kind of kind of neat features that I saw from the different models. We'll look at maybe the top three models, for instance, in this case, and see how they perform, uh, because there was different techniques that were used again, um, random forests, um, CNNs, that sort of thing. And so, if we look at a few of the sites here, it's it's neat when you zoom in on the uh, predictive structure of the the land cover classes. And so, for site one and site three, the Quebec and the Kamloops site, I've got the NRCAN reference ground data on the left uh, that they're they're basically trying to predict. Uh, the Enviro nerds. This was a random forest. This was the first place team. Um, green team on the the middle or middle right here, um, which was using the um, the UNET CNN, which is really neat. A very different uh, machine learning model in this case compared to the random forest. And then in then third place, uh, Team Looney, which was also using a random forest on the right. And so, um, you know, while it's difficult, uh, this we're going to zoom in on a site in a second here to see the sort of um, fine scale details. You can already see sort of the macro scale differences between some of the different, um, different models. Um, you know, if you're looking at the random forest, for instance, between the Enviro nerds and, and Looney, you see these different spatial structures that appear, for instance, um, at the Quebec site um, in some of these mountainous regions. Um, and then again, sort of a different uh, evaluation of the deep blue, which is the forested regions um, from the, the random forest on the right compared to the Enviro nerds on the left. Um, and one other thing that's also neat to, to point out is that all the models do a really good job at, at pulling out um, liquid um, sort of lakes and, and streams and stuff like that. Um, so it was great to see that there was strong performance uh, 
modeling that aspect sort of across the board here. Um, oh, and one other small feature before we move on is the mountains, which was, was neat. I was really curious to see who took time to train their model on snow covered regions, because again, based on my restrictions, which was summer below 60 North, you know, it might've been fairly safe to assume there wouldn't be much snow. Um, and so in some cases in the very peaks of these mountains, there was some snow and you can see the random forests are able to pick that up, uh, but not so much in the CNN in this case, which I thought was kind of a neat result. Um, okay, so let's zoom in. So we're gonna zoom in on the bottom, bottom right corner of this map over here. So this little, uh, if I turn my pointer on here. Uh, so this kind of little section over here, we're gonna zoom in on briefly. Uh, this is that section shown from the NRCAN data set. You can see a, you know, a big finger lake in the middle. Um, there's a roadway that, that snakes up uh, through the center here. And then you've got the mountains on the right, which is kind of neat. Um, and when we look at, for instance, the first place team, the EnviroNerds, you can see they do a really great job at picking out some of those very detailed structures like the road, for instance. Um, you know, this very small subtle stream over here on the right is, is identified in the model. And you're able, even able to see sort of the pieces of roadways in the urban area on the left, even though it's fairly scattered. Um, I think the most interesting thing with model architecture uh, differences is between the random forest and the CNN. So this is the second place team that used the UNET. And so while they have, you know, much better predictive accuracy on things like the deep blues with NRCAN, um, it's, it's, it's kind of neat to see that they have a blotchier kind of predictive structure. So you can see that here compared to the random forest, if I flick back and forth, right? Um, it was, so it still does a very good job, right? Things like the roadway, for instance, are still picked up, but the resolution um, is, is slightly reduced with the, the sort of blocky structure um, that, that appears here. Um, it also does a better job at picking out some of the, the uh, bits and pieces of the roadways um, in the urban areas, which was, which was great to see. Um, one other thing that was kind of neat too is this clipping. So I don't know if you can see where I'm highlighting here, but the, the CNN, and I'm wondering if this is based on how um, data was being sort of fed in or, or chunked together, but every so often you can see these little um, clips um, between edges of uh, the, the areas being predicted, um, which, is, which is also kind of neat to see these features pop up. And then also the Looney one, uh, the Looney model is a random forest, um, also, also had um, you know, a pretty good job of picking out things like the roadway and the lake, for instance, um, but with a bit more scatter perhaps, um, as you can see sort of the hashing around uh, sort of some of the finer details as you move across the, uh, the spatial structure of the scene. Um, yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that. I thought those were some of the kind of interesting features. I'm going to let the uh, members of these teams talk a bit more about their models and, you know, uh, see how they, uh, they evolved over time and, and how they feel about winning some money, I guess. So first we're going to hear from Sam. Uh, Sam, if you want to like unmute and just, just chat for, you know, three or five minutes or whatever you've got, um, we'd love to hear about what you did. Um, sure. For your um, thanks so much, Fraser. I just want to say, first of all, this was a, such a cool experience being part of this group with everyone. And I think um, the work that was put into structuring all of this and, and you know, kind of guiding us through was, was amazing. Um, I started this project a little late, so I was kind of scrambling. Uh, and the what I guess what I'll highlight today is kind of the challenge of steps one, two, three on this diagram, which was like figuring out how to ingest this uh, data that I hadn't worked with before. Um, and pretty early, it, 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 I realized that finding like good coverage of all the land classes was going to be difficult. It wasn't so easy to kind of like sort and find like some of the uh, less frequent land classes in the NRCAN data set. Um, and so what I ended up doing is kind of clipping a handful, about four or five different areas from Sentinel-2, um, just like look, zooming around and trying to find things that looked kind of different from different like corners of Canada. Um, and then I, I used those as kind of like the training data corpus. Um, after I did that, I trained uh, a model and tried to basically validate it and see if it was it was working and I I did notice that as I added more training data it seemed to improve um, but after about four of them I think maybe I wasn't cap the new ones that I was adding weren't capturing the right classes or the missing classes in my model so it, it kind of uh, maxed out on the performance and so at that point I was I was like okay maybe uh, I need to start tweaking the hyperparameters and just like go with the model. It turned out in this 
case with the training data that I had that the random forest did the best um, on the uh, validation sets. Uh, so I went with that, tested out a handful of different hyperparameters, um, chose the one that had the best uh, performance, and then tried it on the test set. And um, yeah, at, at that point, I kind of realized that uh, even the test set, the demo test set that we were given had classes that weren't in my, uh, that weren't like not being predicted at all in any, by any of my, uh, outputs. So I, I, I think that I was missing, uh, important classes in the, in my training data. And, uh, that's something that I think like, had there been more time, I would have been able to go and find that. And, uh, I know that other groups spend a lot of effort doing that and, and it seems to have paid off. Um, the other thing that is that the, Balancing classes was a was a little bit of a tricky um, thing. There were certain classes that were very like I had very very few examples um, out of maybe like I don't know a million. I had like a few dozen. So I, I was my initial reaction was oh I need to upsample these and just make sure that they're more represented so that the um, random forest won't just like never choose them because they're so unlikely. Um, on the other hand, it's possible that some of those classes were actually so uncommon that they, sh you know, that they should be really uh, rarely predicted. So I, ch I chose to upsample all of the uncommon classes up to something like 2% of the data. Um, that was completely arbitrary, but it was something where I felt like, okay, at least they're represented here, um, and even if it's like duplicated data, so that the random forest would then um hopefully like i don't know have a chance of selecting some of the less common classes um but even looking between the different slices that i chose the least common classes in those were, were different too so i didn't want to upsample them too much in case i was um i don't know distorting the sort of average uh i guess like frequency uh, of each class um yeah that's that's basically what I have to say. Um, I, I was originally trying to uh, do a CNN because I thought some of the local information, um, like maybe a three by three or a five by five patch of pixels would be helpful. Uh, but it turned out that that was a little bit tricky with the sizes that I was clipping and it was easier just to kind of clip big chunks and turn them into like, <laughs> like kind of tabular form and then feed that through the uh, random forest. And that one performed better than the the one that I tried training on just one patch too. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, maybe we'll go through each of the, uh, the the individuals, different groups here, and then we can do some questions at the end um, if, if people have those. Um, yeah, it was great to hear from you. Thank you. Um, so for our next, uh, next group here, we have green teams. This is Jason. Um, and if Jason, you want to unmute and chat a bit about your model too, we'd love to hear what you uh, what you did. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me just fine? Just yep. Sure. Cool, cool. All right. So I kind of set out wanting to work with convolutional neural networks. Um, so I immediately focused on um, on doing that. Uh, I'll explain first the data collection, the augmentation, the model, and some other strategies that I had. So. Um, to begin with, uh, you know, I, I selected manually 20 different uh, kind of uh, plots of land uh, all across Canada, um, at least 20 kilometers squared. I don't think I had any snow, so I'm not surprised it didn't do well. Um, and uh, I further subdivided those 20 plots of land into 128 by 128 uh, pixel sizes, um, because that's going to be the input size into... Um, this convolutional neural net architecture that I will explain in a second. Um, and when doing this subdivision, it ended up being a data set of the size like 22,000 patches, um, which might not be enough for a CNN, but it, it, it did okay. Um, and uh, some of the augmentation I did with the, the images, um, when you speak of augmentation, like uh, you might like, flip it, rotate it so that the model doesn't overfit. And so the ones I chose though are just random flips because things like you might see an image classification like skewing the image, you might lose some of that uh, information about the, the how the spectral band relates to the land cover. So I decided not to, to warp the picture at all, just doing random flips to kind of increase the, 
the data set size. Um, so let's talk about the model. So I picked a unit and it's very purposeful to pick a unit uh, or um, there's, a, there's a class of convolutional neural networks that do uh, specifically uh, segmentation. Um, and the unit is a very standard one. It was originally formed for biomedical imaging. Um, and I'll explain like what we see the unit. I have this very simplistic uh, diagram in the middle. Um, and uh, it's kind of made of, I'll describe two parts. One is it takes the inputs, which in this case was the 12 spectral bands, 128 by 128 by 12. Uh, and it encodes it. And what does that mean by encoding it? Well, it's it's going to, with the conv with the convolutions, it's actually going to reduce the height and width dimension and increase the channels. And that's going to like, uh, what it's doing is featurizing and making it a uh, lower dimensional space, like trying to figure out the relationships. And that's what you see in this mo on this diagram is like the blue side. And if you look at the top where the numbers are, you'll see like I have these uh, height, width, and channels. And you see as you go down the encoding, um, the, chan the height width decreases, but the channels increase. And that corresponds to the blue side of this diagram, like you see it, like the, the left side of the U. Um, and then the right side of the U decodes it. So we take the image, we compress it. We're going to decompress it and hopefully get an image back out. Um, and so, yeah, the right side is uh, basically getting back to the image dimensions um, and predicting the classes as well. So you have all these arrows. Well, one of the things is if you, you know, when you compress something, you're going to lose information. So when I compress all these, uh, these spectral bands into this lower dimensional space, decode it back out into the image, um, well, you might lose some information. And that's why maybe it's a little blobby in the picture. But that's why there's these arrows. There's called skip connections. So the ones that go horizontal will take the, the, in, the outputs from the earlier layers and pass them straight to the, 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 uh, the, the later layers, hopefully to preserve some of the information of the original image. So if you look on the right, the output is kind of what it predicted for these 12. And you see the yellow looks really good. It's because it's good at water. Um, and you can see it's not so good at some of the other uh, things. Um, and uh, kind of speaking to maybe some of the things uh, I, I focused on or iterated. Um, well, I, I realized there's an imbalanced uh, problem. Um, so I used class weights. I didn't use upsampling, downsampling, uh, some of these other strategies. I used class weights to modify the loss function directly. And how I did that was in my data set, I looked at the, um, the uh, distribution um, and derived the weights from that. Um, to determine uh, score, the scores, I use 80-20 uh, split test validation, pretty standard. Um, what I could have done, uh, well, in this case, I didn't use NDVI, I didn't do any featurization. I was hoping the model would do that. But maybe it would have been nice to experiment with NDVI, some of these other uh, featurization methods, instead of feeding the 12 bands straight to the model. Um, and then maybe I would have experimented with different loss functions uh, that were probably more sensitive to class and balance. I, I'm not an expert at the, those ones, but um, it might have been nice to experiment there. Um, and then the last thing I was going to say, um, no, I think that's about it. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, really interesting um, model architecture here. Um, I'd definitely like to chat about, about this more with you. Yeah. Okay, uh, cool. Yeah, thanks. So for the last talk here, um, I won't leave it hanging. We've got our first place winners. Congratulations, Leah and Finn. Um, uh, I don't know if both, I can't see the chat, so I don't know if both pe people are here, but feel free to, to talk about your, your model and your, your journey to uh, you know the, the classifier that you ended up making. Yeah, um, so overall, like um, Finn and I, we, let's just say we did a lot of playing around really um, before we got to our final model. Um, so I'll just kind of explain what our main process was to get to the final model. And then we'll actually explain what actually the final model looked like and what you can see here. But essentially uh, what we did is that what, how we approached it was just trying to get multiple extents from various areas. So we got 
uh, areas from the Simcoe region in Ontario. We went to Labrador, James Bay, Montreal, and a bunch of other locations. And from those, we did quite a few testings just per extent on the uh, test data that was given um, and see how the accuracies actually differed. And there was uh, sometimes you could actually see a huge difference in how the accuracies were just based on the extents themselves. Um, and after deciding what extents we wanted to use, we merged the data and then did a subsample, um, mainly because we didn't want to work with millions of points worth of data and we wanted to try various models. So we uh, needed to just cut that down to save time. Um, and then, of course, afterwards, we did lots of <clears throat> primary testing with different models, uh, but ultimately just ended up with random forest just as it performed better than other classifiers. Um, we never tried CNNs. That was <clears throat> a goal in the future if we got to it, but we ended up just not going towards that and sticking with the random forest. Um, we did try different methods of like normalization and we did try cr to create different features. Uh, we created 14 different layers, such as the moisture index, um, but ultimately just stuck with four. And then of course, uh, got very creative trying different techniques such as using Garnison uh, filtering to make the pixels of neighbors look uh, a bit more similar, uh, k-means clustering, um, as well as edge detection, but I'll let Finn go ahead and talk more about uh, how the actual model looks like and how that worked. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm very excited. Uh, let me, so um, it's, the screen's not showing for me anymore. Is that, oh. is that just uh. me? Not sure what happened. Let me reshare. Yeah, I didn't see it either. Okay. <laughs> Is that better? Can you guys see now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Weird. Don't know what happened there. We'll blame it on Jitsi. <laughs> <laughs> Fell asleep. <laughs> um, perfect. So uh, the final model that we ended up submitting is basically two random forests. Um, there's one that's a base, which you can see uh, with the dark blue. Um, those are the features that we ended up putting into that that first model. Um, and that's all of the raws as well as um, a canny edge detection using uh, Skit, uh, Skit Learns uh, canny edge detection from specifically one um, raw. Uh, basically, I found, like, I, I played around a lot with the different canny edges to find um, the, the raw layer and the strength that would give like some nice <laughs> results, um, mostly trying to go after the urban stuff because it was like a lot of fine little roads. And um, so I wanted to try and like detect those fine little edges. Um, I'm not sure how, how it seems like it, it was a bit too fine for it, but I don't know, it seemed like we did really well on the edges. So <laughs> uh, it probably helped. Um, and then, yeah, the calculated layers, uh, which were mentioned earlier, we just stuck with four in the end, um, NDVI, NDWI, Moisture and NDSI. Um, and then those were all trained. So the random forest classifier, uh, with some hyperparameter tuning, trained on on subsamples um, with all of those features extracted from it, and that was the base model. Um, what I had found uh, while messing with um, Gaussian blurring was that it helped a lot with uh, cropland specifically because cropland does those big swaths, um, and Gaussian blurring helps uh, sort of and normalize things like uh, neighbors that are closer together will become more similar. So the idea is to strengthen, like to make these clusters, um, which was also why I tried the k-means clustering um, on just all the raws uh, with four clusters, I think in the end, um, mostly just try and distinguish like these big patches. Cause I think that's the big thing um, that's lost not using CNNs is the spatial structure. Um, so I really wanted to try and like get that back in somehow. Um, but overall, it, the if it was the random forest perf uh, trained on that, performed a lot worse um, with most classes, but really, really well with cropland. Um, so what I ended up doing was I uh, made like a function that intakes one random forest as the base, so that's the first one, and then just takes the class 15 predictions 
from the other model and updates it. Um, so it just takes the, the cropland predictions basically. And so that combination um, was the, the final submission. Yeah, I think that, that uh, sums it up. <laughs> As Leah said, a lot of playing around. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's yeah. The amount of work you guys put into the the featureization, I think, is is really really neat, and it, it goes to show with the final um, performance in, with with uh, the classific classification accuracy that you guys ended up getting. So, really neat. And also, it's also cool to hear about sort of the the path a lot of people took. A lot of people, it seemed like, ended up wanting to to work with the CNN at the end, um, but either didn't have time or found that you know, hey, the random force was actually doing quite well, so I'm going to stick with that. Um, so it's kind of a cool result I wasn't expecting. Made for a good distribution of models to, to test against at the end here. So, um, Leah, did you have any other final comments before, is Leah still here? Did she, did she drop off? I don't know. Oh, no, I'm here. No, uh, no extra comments. I think it was just a great experience and working with new data and honestly, Ben's an awesome teammate. Um, it was a great time. <laughs> Awesome. Thank Great you for the hear. project. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, so those, I, I had those as the sort of the top three teams to talk about their models, but we've got other, you know, other groups here. I don't know if anybody else wanted to chat briefly about, um, you know, what went into to, to their models and training and that sort of thing. Uh, feel free to unmute and do so now if, you, if you'd like to chat about that. No pressure, if not okay as well but thought i would ask um okay do we have any any other questions from the audience about uh the work that was just spoken about i mean now is maybe a good time to do that if not our slack group is always open i don't know if they're planning on closing it actually um, but feel free to, to post questions in there. I'm sure everybody would be happy to, to talk more about their work. I know I'll be reaching out to a few groups because I'm curious about what they did um, in a bit more detail. So keep that in mind. Um, for everybody who won, which is everybody, because everybody that presented or that submitted something um, is going to walk away with some prize money, right? Um, please fill out this link. I'm going to post this in the, sl the Slack as well. Um, it's just a little Google form so that we know, um, you know, where to send the the money to. I think Amar is going to handle that step um, with aggregate intellect, but um, I'm going to post that. Please fill that out um, sooner than later so that we can get that um, all sorted and everybody can get some money. Um, and I would also just like to thank, you know, aggregate intellect um, and NRCAN um, as well for providing the, you know, the funding for this, uh, for setting up such a cool working group and a really neat challenge here. Um, I, I hope everybody learned something. I know I did. And I would recommend if you get a chance to check out some of the other groups that are spinning up just now. There's a really cool drone project, um, which is also building on you know, this idea of, of um, classification using image data, which is really, really neat. Um, so I would take a look at that if you're interested. And in, you know, they've got a whole bunch of projects that seem to be coming up all the time. So you know, keep your eyes peeled on that aggregate intellect Slack channel and, and see if uh, anything sort of catches your eye. Um, as for me, uh, I had a great time working with everybody and I'd just like to say thank you. And I hope to see you all again in future projects. So stay in touch. Uh, yeah, that's all for me. So I'm gonna stop sharing and just, yeah, say thank you. I don't know, if, does anybody else have any sort of final comments, I guess, at this point? Let me just- Thank, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank Fraser for really putting this together. This was a phenomenal job by him and aggregate intellect and NR can really set the infrastructure, but he was the one who really made up this all happen. So thank you so much for that. Fraser. Yeah, no worries. That was a great time. Andre, Karen, do you want to give some final thoughts before we call it? Well, I guess I would just thank Fraser for organizing this group. I think this one was really well done. Um, and uh, also the the last presentation, um, the the last group that presented, uh, Finn and Leah, that was a really creative solution. Um, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, um, yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Andre. Is uh, Karen still here? I guess Karen had to drop off. 
All right, all right. Um, I'll share my screen. I want to show everyone just one last thing. So Fraser talked about more groups starting off. So all of those are on our community website. You can access it by community.ai.science. Just hit up join a community project. And we usually try to launch at least one project every two weeks. So you can check out which ones are starting. We have one on stream pro prediction, another one on recommender systems, another one on machine learning and blockchain starting off in just the next 30 days. So uh, there's a favorite coming up. On that same landing page, if you scroll down below, there's a chance to uh, subscribe to our newsletter. So we give weekly updates on whatever new projects are coming up with details and instructions on how to join in. And uh, with that, uh, I guess that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thanks, sir. Thanks guys. I'm going to post Thank that you. link in the Slack. Thank you. Fill that out. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye, Have a good one.